Amen. We gather in the house of the Lord, our amazing and indescribable God. Invite you to be seated today. And as you are, if you take your bulletins, we'd like to share a few announcements with you. We'd like to just start off with a gracious note of thanks and praise to God who is so good to us. And uh, you know, a lot of times we go right into announcements and tell you all the things we're doing or going to do or, or the needs or the requests. And we wanted to start with a moment of thanksgiving and uh, church board met yesterday and it was evident to me as I had been putting that board packet together all week long uh, that over and over again God has been putting things in place for us to meet needs even before we knew they were existing and uh, some great creative partnerships that have come about this year uh, we think of loaves and fishes and being able to meet some needs in our communities and how that came about uh, some things that had to be replaced here and at the parsonage that were unexpected, but we were very easily able to meet those needs. And just kind of over and over again, creative partnerships that God has been putting in place. And uh, we want to thank you for your participation, your generosity in sharing in those things. God has been using you to meet needs. And uh, we are grateful for that and uh, just grateful for what God is doing and wanted to pause and give thanks this morning. We do have a couple of announcements we just want to share. You'll see at the bottom of the insert that we talk about our missionary books, which are out in the foyer. And if you've not picked up a missionary book to read and hear an encouraging story from around the world, we would invite you to do one. Grab one on your way out. There's a card you can sign and leave behind so we know where it is. And if you have a book, you could bring it back so somebody else can take it out and read that. And so those are there for you as well. And then I want to ask you to be in prayer for our Kairos Torch Ministry. It's not our Kairos Torch Ministry. We partner and participate with other churches uh, in Kairos Torch, which is a ministry to uh, incarcerated individuals in the Long Creek Youth Development Center. And specifically this spring, this winter and spring, we are uh, doing a weekend for girls. They were praying about a girls weekend at the Long Creek Youth Development Center. We do need both men and women to participate on the team. And in the, in the uh, insert here in the announcement, uh, you can read when the training sessions are, the dates that those will be happening. Um, I would tell you that every session is important and you ought to be at every session. I would also say that if you have to miss one of those five sessions, don't let that keep you from being on the team. Uh, we need team members, and so if you know one of those dates doesn't work but the rest do, uh, don't write yourself off. We'd love to have you. You might know somebody in your circle of influence, in your email prayer group, in your Facebook group, somebody who's looking for a ministry to do this winter uh, and who would be able to participate. And so on the one hand, maybe you could serve, but maybe you know somebody that the Lord is calling to serve and you would share that information with them. The very first training session... Uh, is January 24th, so not this Saturday, but next Saturday uh, from 9 to 4, and then you can see the dates listed uh, for that. So I invite you to be in prayer for Kairos Torch. If you have questions, see me, see Fred or Diane, and we'll be happy to help you out with that. If you know someone who's interested, put them in touch with us right away so we can help out with that. And then as we finish up 2014 and we move into 2015, and I... You know, I downloaded my tax program yesterday and started working on my taxes. I got my first, uh, first W-2, came in the mail the other day. Isn't that amazing? Um, and so maybe you're starting to think about that and you're looking back over 2014. And, you know, sometimes we set out with really good intentions of what we plan to do, either faith promise or capital campaign or regular tithes and offerings to the church. And we get to the end of the year and we start looking back and we say, well, I had good intentions, uh, I came close but didn't get as close as I would have liked to and uh, we always want to give you tools to help you with that. So at the very beginning of 2015, would encourage you to use one of a couple of tools. We have these great boxes of envelopes and they're numbered and they're dated. First Sunday in January, second Sunday in January, all the way up through. Uh, they're numbered so that you can get a nice tax receipt at the end of the year and uh, those are just free boxes in the library. We'd encourage you to use them to help you be consistent in generosity and in stewardship. And the other tool we have, of course, is our online giving. And uh, we have a couple of us here in the congregation and others 
out in cyber world who use our online giving at give.capenazarene.org. And I uh, really appreciate those gifts because you can set them up automatic. And uh, you can give of the very first fruits to happen right away when your paycheck, maybe your paycheck comes in on Thursday, directly deposited to your account. Uh, you can give on Friday and you can use a check deposit. You don't even need to use plastic to do that. And uh, so if you've been saying, well, I have good intentions, but I haven't quite made it, uh, we have a couple tools to help you in 2015. And if you'd like more information on either of those, how to set them up, please just let me know. And uh, I would say... No one's too old to use electronic giving, and I know this because of some of the folks who are using it. So uh, let me just say that. Don't be scared of the technology. Uh, it's safe. It's secure. I use it, and uh, let me know if you have questions or how to use it. We can help you set that up. That's all I have for announcements this week. I would remind you of Loaves and Fishes Tuesday night. We had a great time. It was a lot of fun this past Tuesday, and just sharing a meal together and outreach to a couple folks who came and joined us. There is an article in the Century Front page, above the fold, full color photos. It was awesome. We are grateful and thankful. There's a copy on the bulletin board for you to look at. There are three or four copies in the foyer if you'd like to take one uh, and look more closely at it. But we are excited about uh, how God's going to use that. So pray for us on Tuesday night. Come and join us and share a meal together and uh, wonderful community and companionship. This week's menu is chicken casserole, salad, rolls, and brownies, something like that. Something like that. Okay, chicken casserole, that's the key part. But come and join us and share a meal Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, open to anyone in the community. I'd like to invite you to hear our call to worship today, Psalm 107. Hear the word of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands from east and west from north and south. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. As we gather today, we have reason to be thankful, to be grateful. Let us stand and let us tell of his works with songs of joy today.
almighty and gracious God, here in this, your house, we gather to cry, holy, 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 Lord God almighty. We are a people of gratitude and thanksgiving, our eyes alert and awake to recognize the light, to see the ways in which you are at work in our midst, in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our communities. And so, Lord, while there are certainly things in our world which cause us to have heavy hearts and burdens this day, we also gather with hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving for all that you have done. We thank you for those who give generously to the work of the Lord here and around the world. We thank you for your people here in Cape Elizabeth, but also those connected through the internet or in our communities who've been moved to be generous Lord, even as we give sometimes to things that don't benefit us at all, we give thanks for the ways in which you work in and through us to accomplish your purposes all over the world. So, Lord, we give you thanks. Forever you are good. Forever your love endures and you are gracious to your children. Lord, we give you thanks. Today, as we gather here, we ask that you would, you would fill us with your presence that we would hear your word in fresh and new ways, that here at the beginning of this new calendar year, as we think about ways in which to be better, to be deeper, to be improved, that first and foremost, we would start by plugging into what you want for us, that we would be willing to be obedient and submissive to you. So Lord, our prayer today is not simply that you would meet our needs, our prayer is that we would hear your voice and that we would obey. Lord, receive our worship. Receive our meditations, our tithes, our offerings, our songs. May it all add glory and beauty to your name. Lord, we give you thanks. It's in the name of Jesus that we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Amen. We invite you to be seated this morning as the ushers come and help us to continue to worship God as we give to him of our best, the first and the best of what he shared with us as we give it to the Lord today. Ushers, if you'd come. invite you to be seated as we turn our hearts and our minds toward the reading of God's Word. Good morning. I'm reading from the Old Testament today, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 15. First fruits and tithes. When you have entered the land of the Lord, your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. 
Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name, and say to the priest in official at that time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to this land the Lord swore to our forefathers to give to us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Armenian, and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, putting us to hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, with great terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, our Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow down before him. And you and the Levites and the aliens among you shall rejoice in all good things the Lord your God has given to you and your household. When you have finished setting aside a tithe of all your produce in the third year, the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. Then say to the Lord your God, I have removed from my house the sacred portion and have given it to the Levite, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all you commanded. I have not turned aside from your commands, nor have I forgotten any of them. I have not eaten any of the sacred portion which, uh, while I was in mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor have I offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God. I have done everything you commanded me. Look down from heaven, your holy dwelling place, and place your people and bless your people of Israel and the land you have given us as you promised on oath to our forefathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. May God bless the reading of his word. Our second lesson this morning is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I invite you to be in prayer today for our brother John as he serves as a chaplain's assistant on National Guard Weekend this weekend. And so be in prayer for me because that means I'm leading hymns. I invite you to stand with us as we sing together 124, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Have you ever had one of those uh, experiences in a store where you, you kind of have this experience and as you're walking out of the store, you just kind of scratch your head and you say to yourself, who's in charge here anyway? <laughs> right? Ever had that? You kind of know what I mean? I, I got to tell you, on Monday this week, Melody and I had one of those experiences. I won't tell you the name of the store, although you might figure it out, but I, We just wanted to print a couple pictures, two pictures. That was it, because we wanted to pick one to go in a particular frame. And we were already planning to go to one particular store anyway, and so I went on their website, I uploaded the pictures and uh, ordered them, 13 cents a piece, and one cent for Augusta, 27 cents total, right? Ready in one hour, no problem. So we did a couple things first before we went out, and we we got to the store. I went to go get the other thing we needed, which was a bucket of ice melt, a big 50-pound bucket of ice melt. There's your clue as to where I'm at, okay. And uh, Melody went to the photo counter, which is right there by the entrance to the store, and uh, I found my 50-pound bucket of ice melt on the far end of the store, carried it up to the self-checkout lane on the other far end of the store, paid for it, made my way back to the door where I could still see Melody standing at the photo counter, that nobody yet was arrived behind the photo counter to take care of her or the person who was in line in front of her. Um, so I motioned to her and said, let's go, we'll just come back later and, and uh, get our pictures. So we went off, we went to Freeport to go see Unbroken, by the way, if you've not seen Unbroken, if you've not read Unbroken by Laura Hillenbrand, a great story of faith and resilience and forgiveness, it's a World War II story. Uh, It's not necessarily for the faint of heart, but if uh, this is the sort of thing that interests you, I would uh, commend the movie to you. Anyway, we went to go up to Freeport, saw Unbroken, had dinner, and uh, came back to South Portland, Scarborough actually, there's another clue for you, it's right on the line there between (laughs) Scarborough and South Portland, and to try again with our photos, and uh, it was cold, it was cold Monday, right? So this time Melody stayed in the car, left the car running, and I went in to go get our two photos. 27 cents in my pocket, mind you. I went up to the photo counter, which was empty, but there was a guy at the eyeglasses counter right next door, Last clue, you all know where I'm at now. Uh, There was a guy at the eyeglasses counter right next door, so I said, can you help me get my photos? He said, sure, he comes on over, gets the pictures out for me, and uh, while I'm waiting for him to come do this, finish up at the eye counter and come over to get my pictures, I saw there's a sign right there on the photo counter that lists the hours of the photo counter. It says they close at eight o'clock, no problem. I looked at my cell phone, it was 7.55, I'm in good shape here, all set, plenty of time. The guy from the eyeglass counter comes over, he finds my photos, and I pull out my 27 cents, ready to pay for it. Oh no, I'm sorry, there's no cash drawer here. You'll have to take that up front. Strange, I thought. Since I've paid for photos at the photo counter before, there's usually a cash drawer here, but, well, I started to head up toward the front, just in time to meet the photo counter employee coming back to the photo counter with the empty cash drawer. He had cashed out for the day at 7.56. I go up to the main line. Fortunately, the woman in front of me who has a large shopping cart full of large purchases. <laughs> if you haven't figured out, I'm at, a, I'm at one of those wholesale warehouse clubs. All right, okay, I won't tell you which one, but it's the one in Scarborough and South Portland, so, okay. <laughs> she sees I just have this little photo envelope. She waves me through, which is nice, and I go up to the register. The guy scans my card, he scans the photo envelope, and the register kicks up that I owe 28 cents pull out 27 cents out of my pocket, which is what the computer told me I had to pay. And I, Anyway, the cashier was not going to make me swipe my plastic in order to pay for my photos. He let me get out one cent less. So it was the only good thing that happened all day was the cashier felt empowered to take care of me. I left the store wondering and scratching my head saying, who's in charge here? I mean, clearly, we could just list all the breakdowns between the the website computer and the computer that runs the cash register, the management, the sign on the counter, the employee, and what the employee actually did, and all of that that just kind of doesn't seem to coalesce into a good experience and leaves you wondering, who's in charge here anyway? You wonder if the problem is at the national level, the regional level, if it's local store management or just a breakdown within the store, but you leave wondering... Who's in charge here anyway? So this morning, I actually want to invite all of us to just take a long, hard look at our lives and ask ourselves the question, who's in charge here anyway? 
In fact, we're gonna do this for the next several weeks. We'll just sort of be asking that question a lot as we look at our lives, our calendars, our checkbooks, our gifts, our talents, our church, our responsibilities, and together we'll ask the question of ourselves as individuals and as a community, we'll ask, who's in charge here anyway? So for the next few weeks, we're gonna look at the concept of stewardship and exactly what it means to consider ourselves to be a steward of something. Now I know already some of our blood pressure just kicked up a notch or two because we hear the word stewardship and we immediately think money and so just immediately there was this kind of assumption in the room and yes, stewardship includes teaching about some biblical principles of money management and generosity but stewardship is about so much more than that and it's actually not even primarily about finances. In fact, if I could boil the word stewardship down to just one question, it would be this. Who's in charge here anyway? That really is the question of stewardship. If I had to boil it down to one word, it wouldn't be money. If I had to boil stewardship down to one word, the word would be obedience. Because stewardship is all about whether or not we're being obedient to the master who has entrusted certain resources to us. That's what stewardship is all about. So let me just back up and start with this question. What is a steward? A steward is someone who takes care of something for someone else, okay? Uh, Some of you have been stewards of the parsonage cat. Okay, right? Melody and I have to go away, and there are a handful of you who have had over time that responsibility of coming in and checking in on the parsonage kitty and making sure she's fed and watered and cleaned up after and had a little attention given to her. Brenda is the steward of the church checkbook, right? It's not her money, but she takes care of it. She pays the bills. She tracks every penny very carefully. She reports to the church board how it is spent. Church treasurers don't make the decisions about how the money is spent. They carry out the decisions that are given to them. (coughs) Another example, Melody and I, we are stewards of the parsonage, right? It's not our house. We won't take it with us someday when we go. We are responsible to take care of it, though. There is a certain expectation that you all have and that we all have. It. We, we take care of it. We keep it clean. We take care of minor repairs. We let the church board know when there need to be major repairs and, and uh, you know something needs to be replaced. But at the end of the day, it's not our house. We are stewards of it. We care for it. We make it into our home. If you've read or watched the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Tolkien, We are introduced to Denethor. Denethor is this character known as the Steward of Gondor. Some of you know what I'm talking about, okay? Very quickly, in the Middle-earth legends, the stewards of Gondor were not kings, but after the line of kings had failed, the stewards were responsible to care for the kingdom until the return of the king, to give it back to the king when the king surfaced. They were to safeguard the throne, to govern the people, but not for themselves, but for the purpose of handing the kingdom back to the rightful king when he returned. So a steward takes care of something for someone else. And really, after all those illustrations, there is no better illustration of a steward than the one given to us by Jesus in Matthew 25. Let me read for you our gospel lesson today. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. That's the definition of a steward, right? To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. Forever has will be given more, and they will have in abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now the parable talks about bags of gold. Um, so we can talk about it as a money parable, uh, but we have traditionally, the church has understood its lessons to not only be about financial management, but really that these bags of gold, these, these things represent every aspect of our lives, our money, our time, our abilities, our relationships. In fact, really, this simple parable could be extended to help us care for anything that God has entrusted to us our bodies, our children, our homes, our, our world, the animals, the resources in the earth, and so on. We are reminded constantly that none of these things are ours, but they have been entrusted into our care. Even at the very creation of the world, Adam and Eve were given responsibility, stewardship for the earth, to care for the garden, to name the animals, to be wise and good stewards of everything God had given them. But the parable is a reminder that our role in the kingdom of God is that of steward. Are you a Sunday school teacher? You are a steward of those you teach. Are, are you a parent? You are a steward of the children God has entrusted to you. Are, are you a board member? You are a steward of the building and the people are you a technology guy? You're a steward of the computer and the video cameras and the sound equipment. Are you the preacher? You're a steward of the teaching, the vision, the ministry of the church. Are you a musician or a worship leader? You're a steward of the instruments, the worshiping body and the environment and the atmosphere. Are you a scripture reader? Are you an usher? Do you work in the kitchen? Do you greet people at the door? You are a steward for all of those areas. So what does that mean? Well, I think, I think it means this. You are responsible to hand those areas off better than you received them, right? I mean, if you, if you accept a responsibility, a, a stewardship role, you are responsible to take that, to nurture it, and to hand it off to the next person better than it was when you found it. It means that God has given you a sacred trust, not just to dig a hole and bury that ministry, but to find ways for that ministry to grow and to flourish, to return them to him at least with banker's interest, but really with growth. God does not want us to simply hide these things into the ground. God does not want us to simply settle into maintenance mode. But our responsibility of stewards of his church is to do whatever we can to add value, to grow the resource, to invest and to pour ourselves into it. See, I told you this wasn't just about money. In a lot of ways, this is harder than just money, isn't it? Sometimes it's easy to write a check. I'm suggesting a steward has to pour their very lives into this thing that God has entrusted to them. Sometimes that means God calls us to take risks, right? I mean, the unfaithful servant, he failed, not because he lost the bag of gold, 
but because he didn't do anything with it. He didn't take a risk. He didn't do anything to increase its value. He didn't take any risks to make it grow. And the message seems to be that God would rather we at least take a risk with the thing he has entrusted to us than to simply settle into maintenance mode and bury it in the ground. When we talk about stewardship, the key point for us to remember is that the resource is never really ours to begin with. The bags of gold did not belong to the servants. The one servant was no richer than the other servant. It was money that had been entrusted to them. I often remind the church board of this. If you've ever heard this conversation, I always say, just remember, the building doesn't belong to us, the pews don't belong to us, the people don't belong to us, and the offering plates don't belong to us. At the same time, there's good news on the other side of that coin, right? It also means the bills don't belong to us. Oh, we're responsible for them, right? But as stewards of God's kingdom, we trust him because they're ultimately his bills and concerns. We're responsible to participate and to partner, but if we are obedient to God in caring for the resources, we can trust God to help us meet the bills too. Because at the end of the day, At the end of the day, hear me say this before we say anything else about stewardship in the next few weeks. At the end of the day, stewardship is about obedience. Stewardship is about submission. Stewardship is about recognizing that I am not in charge of my own life. God is. The church board is wonderful and talented and responsible as they are. They are not in charge of the church. God is. Stewardship is about obedience. It's about submission. It's about caring for the things God has entrusted to us. Earlier, Melody read that classic passage from Philippians 2. Some of you have been around and probably heard me read that passage or refer to that passage so many times, you know it forward and backwards by now. If you've been around, you know it's one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, a beautiful and poetic reminder of everything Christ did for us. Sometimes we refer to it as the kenosis passage, the emptying passage. These verses, they're like a beautiful hymn or a poem, maybe one of the earliest creeds, and they remind us of Christ's self-emptying movement, taking on the human condition in order to lead us through death into life everlasting. So if you look closely at Philippians 2, you see it starts with this downward movement, right? Verses 6 through 8 tell us about the humility and submission of Christ. He became nothing. He took on the nature of a servant, found in human likeness, humbled himself, was obedient to death, even death on a cross, right? This downward movement of Christ, this self-emptying movement. But don't stop there. That's not the end of the kenosis passage. It's not the end of the emptying passage. For we know that Christ was victorious over death and the grave, And verses 9 through 11 tell us about the upward movement, the elevation of Christ as Lord, that he's exalted to the highest place. He's given the name that is above every name. In other words, the incarnation we've talked about the last few weeks, it is fulfilled in the ascension, the crucifixion that we'll talk about in a couple of months. It will be answered in the resurrection. We know that Christ has died but we also affirm that Christ is risen. The downward motion of Christ is answered in the elevation of Christ. And Paul concludes this hymn with the reminder that one day, one day, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you get that every? I mean, that's great. It's hard to get people to agree on something, isn't it? We can't even agree on which football team we like. Um, (laughs) All right? It's hard to get people to agree on something, but this every knee should bow, every tongue confess a great global agreement on what you and I already know to be true, that Jesus Christ is Lord. But I want to talk about that little word, confess. What does it mean to confess something? It's, It's complicated in English. Confess can have a variety of meanings, right? We can confess or admit our sins, right? That's one. We can confess our sins. We can admit our sins. 
We can confess that something is true, agreeing that something is true. That would be another meaning of confess. Or we can confess allegiance. We can vow allegiance to something or someone. We can admit, we can agree, we can vow allegiance. What meaning does Paul want us to hear here in Philippians 2? Well, sometimes when you see a verse like that, you realize that the author's quoting or drawing from an Old Testament passage. And if you look at Isaiah 45, uh, verse 23, you're going to find a verse that is so very nearly identical to this verse 11 here. It's so so similar, I think it's quite certain that Paul is drawing from Isaiah 45, 23. This is what we read. God gave these words to the prophet. To me, every knee, right? Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. This is the words Isaiah uses. I think it's pretty likely that what we get translated out of Philippians chapter 2 as confess into English really probably should be closer to how we've translated Isaiah 45. Every knee should bow, every tongue to swear allegiance. That's what it means to confess that Christ is Lord. We're not just saying that everyone should confess their sins. We're not just saying everybody should agree on this idea that Jesus is Lord If Paul's drawing on the writings of Isaiah, it's clear that in this context, to confess is to swear allegiance to Christ. In other words, here's where it goes back to stewardship. We don't simply confess this truth with our lips. You can't just swear allegiance to something with your lips. If you join the armed forces, it's more than just simply taking a vow and swearing allegiance. You have to put action to the swearing of allegiance. We do not merely pay lip service to the idea of Christ as king. We confess this truth with our lives, with our actions, with our attitudes, with our whole being. We confess this truth with the way we plan our calendar. We confess this truth with the way we use our abilities, with the way we spend our resources. As a congregation, we confess this truth in the way we offer hospitality to others, specifically right now, through loaves and fishes. We confess this truth through how we minister to young people through Cairo's torch. We confess this truth through giving generously to mission projects around the world, ministries that never benefit us. But we confess that Christ is Lord by participating in his kingdom all over the world. As individuals, we we confess this truth through our own spiritual disciplines, through church attendance, through Bible engagement, through prayer, through witnessing, through obedience. These are all ways that we confess, we live out our allegiance. So here we are, the second Sunday of the new year, and pastor wants you to ask yourself a question. Who's in charge here anyway? I don't just mean here in this building, in this congregation, you understand, although that's part of the question. But imagine that someone walks up to the photo counter of your life. That someone walks up to you, they've heard the the words that have come out of your mouth, of what you say is true. And they come up to the photo counter of your life and expect that your calendar and your checkbook and your attitudes and your actions all match up with the idea of what it means to be a Christ follower. Will they immediately recognize who's in charge of your life? Or will they walk away scratching their heads, asking themselves the question, who's in charge here anyway? So I just want to give you a few seconds. Take a moment right now. We're not even going to wait for prayer time. I just want you to take a moment right now and ask God to help you answer that question in your life. Ask God to point out areas in which maybe you're still holding the reins, areas in which you're not yet living under Christ's authority. Would you take a moment and ask yourself, who's in charge here anyway? And I'm going to give you another challenge this morning. This is a little tough because I know it's winter. 
You know, some of us have travel plans already and, and some of us are going to get sick and we can't control that and the weather will interfere with the challenge I'm about to give to, okay? So I know that. But I also know sometimes it's easy for us to make excuses for ourselves and uh, sometimes we miss out on what God has in store because of that. So I, I want to give you just one more challenge to be here every week that you can for the next four or five weeks. Uh, eliminate, eliminate as many excuses as you can and plan to be here. And when you can't, when you're away or, or when you're sick, Join us online afterwards. They're always up. You can always watch them or listen to them right on our website. Carve out the hour it would take to do it and give it your full attention over the next few weeks to join us as we explore this journey of stewardship. What does it mean to recognize that God's in charge and that I'm just a steward of all that he's entrusted to us? This is one of the most important series we can do as a church, and I don't want any of us to miss out on it. So if you can't make it here in person, commit to join us and uh, now before we sing and pray, I want to leave you with a little story, a little lighthearted story. It's a story told by Stan Toller, the former general superintendent in the Church of the Nazarene, and, and he writes this. A man once came to Peter Marshall, former chaplain of the United States Senate, with a concern about tithing. I have a problem, he said. I have been tithing for some time. It wasn't too bad when I was making $20,000 a year. I could afford to give up $2,000. But now that I'm making $500,000, there's no way I can afford to give away $50,000 a year. Funny how perspective gives us different problems, right? <laughs> I mean, Stan doesn't write this, but most of us say, okay, I can't afford to tithe when I'm doing $20,000 a year. If only I were making $500,000, I could easily tithe on, right? right? All right. Dr. Toller continues his story. He says this. Peter Marshall reflected on this wealthy man's dilemma, but gave no advice. He simply said, yes, sir, I see that you have a problem. I think we ought to pray about it. Is that all right? The man agreed, so Dr. Marshall bowed his head and prayed. Dear Lord, this man has a problem, and I pray that you will help him. Please reduce his salary back to the place where he can afford to tithe. <laughs> We laugh, but let me drive this back to the key point, right? It's always about obedience. It's never about how much or how little. It's never about how many bags of gold God entrusted you with. It's always about obedience. It's always about being faithful, about investing ourselves into the things God has given us to do and then giving back to the master even more than what we received. It's about living every aspect in our lives with the recognition that indeed, God, God is in charge here. Melody's going to come and uh, we're going to take time to sing a simple prayer today. The prayer is, I give all my service to you. I give all my problems to you. I give all my family to you. I give all my future and my worship to you. As we sing these simple words today, would you stand with us and make it your prayer? It's already his anyway, but let's acknowledge that God is in charge here.
you join me as we bow our hearts before the Lord of Lords and King of Kings today? Lord, we echo the the words of this song that talk about not only giving you all the good things in our lives, but also giving you all of our problems, our concerns, our burdens, our family, the things in our lives that are not the way we would want them to be. We give all of that to you too, and we say, Lord, would you be in charge here? I can't fix it. I can't control it. Would you be in charge here? Lord, even this week, we are mindful of just horrible news coming out of Nigeria. And France. And even in our own country. Lord, there are things that try to remind us that you're not in charge. But we want to continually affirm, to stubbornly stare down the darkness and say, Lord, we give this to you and you are in charge. Would you reveal to us your purposes, your plans, and your glory in the midst of all of this? And Lord, as we hear the words of Scripture today, words that challenge us, that make us a little uncomfortable at times. We're forced to ask the difficult questions of who's in charge here anyway. Lord, help us to not simply confess with our lips, but to swear allegiance with all of ourselves that we are but stewards in your kingdom, of your church, of your resources, of your people, We are stewards of the talents that you've entrusted to us, our gifts, our abilities, of our areas of responsibility. We are stewards of the money and the land and the property that we think we own, but it's really yours. We're stewards of the minutes in our calendar It's really yours. So Lord, in these moments, would you hear our prayers to you as we ask you for the strength, the courage, the ability to make changes in our lives, to be as obedient as we can. That we would continue to grow in obedience to your word and your kingdom. Lord, hear our prayers today. Lord, you have also entrusted us with a message, with good news. You have entrusted us with the gospel of Jesus who died that our sins might be forgiven, who rose that we might live eternally. Lord, we confess there have been times when we've kept that message to ourselves. We've not always been a good steward of that message in our own lives or even as a church. Lord, forgive us of the times when we've been timid or shy or uncertain or we've simply been disobedient to what we know you asked us to do. Lord, forgive us. And help us to be stewards of that message who share the good news in any way we can through our words, our attitudes, our actions, through technology, through email, through personal conversation, through invitations. Lord, let us be good stewards of that good news, that gospel message. Let us freely share what you have given to us. We reenact that message, the core of that good news, when we gather at the table 
And we give thanks for Jesus who died for us and rose again for our sake. And the night he was betrayed as he sat with his disciples and blessed and broke and shared bread, saying, this is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner after they had eaten, he took the cup and blessed and shared it with them, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. And we gather to remember and to retell and to relive that good news, to participate in the kingdom feast that it might become part of us, that we might overflow with brokenness and goodness for the world around us. Lord, would you pour out your spirit upon these gifts and upon these your people. May we be good stewards of the message you have entrusted to us. We are bold to ask all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God are given for the people of God. We invite you to come to his table to feast at the kingdom feast that you might participate in and share this story with all the world around. Would you come? body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, was broken that we might be made whole. Eat this and remember that Christ died for you. The cup of the new covenant in Jesus' blood, may it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life.
Good and gracious God, we are thankful for the gifts you have lavished upon us, your children. For the gifts of companionship and fellowship, of family, of food, of warmth. For the gift of your church. But most of all, for the gift of Jesus, who willingly laid down his life for us and was raised again to new and unending life. It is in his name that we give thanks. Amen and amen. Would you stand and join us for our closing hymn today? 487, I am resolved no longer to linger. to share a lengthy benediction for the next several weeks, but I want you to be prepared to hear it each week, and may it soak into your hearts and your souls. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in his grace and his peace today.